True or false? If something is not in the Bible, it's false. One person says false. True or false? Don't be afraid to answer. False. So if someone tells you that what we do and celebrate is not in the Bible, what do you tell them? That their words are false. And why would you tell them that? But first of all, you shouldn't know what the Bible says. If you don't know what the Bible says, you're going to have to keep quiet. But there's nowhere in the Bible that says if it's not in the Bible, it is false. If something is in the Bible, it's true. But there's no way in Scripture that says if something is not in the Bible, it is false. And for those who have been coming and for those who have been paying attention when you come, you will see how we have debunked that statement with purgatory, with the intercession of the saints, with the doctrine of the Trinity, and so many other doctrines in our church that have developed over time because of the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Jamaica is a Christian country, but too many Christians speak what not so in the Bible. And so when they speak and say, Scripture says, you must either be able to verify it or say to them, I'll get back to you. Because today's celebration, the assumption of our Blessed Mother, some will say it's not in the Bible. Just like how they will say purgatory is not in the Bible. The intercession of the saints is highly questionable. Trinity is not in the Bible. And some of what you do, those practices are not evident in the Bible. Some will say today's assumption of our Blessed Mother is not in the Bible. Is artificial intelligence in the Bible? And yet it exists. Is the word computer and technology as separate words? Are they in the Bible? Yet they exist. So for those who take the time to read scripture, understand scripture, and are not content to live shallow lives, will take comfort and confidence in what we do. In every group, you'll always have a few who are on fire for the faith. Then you'll have the vast majority who will want to learn. But you will always have that little group who have no clue. Whether they're present in church or not, they're just not paying attention and therefore they will never learn. And so when they are confronted with false claims from others, these are the ones who quickly leave the church because they never took time to learn what we do, what we believe in the first place. And it doesn't matter how young they are. It doesn't matter how old they are. If we do not spend the time to learn and appreciate, how will we become sources of good news? And how will we challenge others who make false statements? The reality of falsity is so prevalent in our society that people don't even know the difference between truth and falsity anymore. The reality of fake news, another nice term for gossiping, another nice term for blatant lie, is very much evident. When people speak with each other, honesty is absent too often. When people make their posts on social media, they don't take the time to investigate. And so they pass on that which is not true, and therefore that which is not of God. Let's look at the assumption. First of all, from a biblical basis. Now, we could spend the entire day looking at this, so I'll just keep it to the point. In the book of Genesis, we hear that the Lord created Adam and Eve, the first woman. Mary, over time, is understood to be the new Eve, 
the one who will bring new life, Jesus Christ, into the world, the creator of all that exists. So this new Eve actually goes against the errors of the old Eve. What did the old Eve do? She listened to the father of lies. Her ears were not only quite ready to listen to the lie told to her, but she was ready to act on it. So that the first, quote unquote, woman in the Bible, although she had that deep relationship with God who came and walked with them in the cool of the evening, they heard his voice, they felt his presence. Somewhere along the line, the father of lies moved in. She listened, she obeyed the father of lies, and thus sin and death came into the world. Fast forward. Mary, the new Eve, would have been tempted to not listen to the voice of God who said, I'm calling you to be the mother of Jesus. Mary, the new Eve, understood that God had a special task for her, but she was always free to say no. And we hear her struggle with her being chosen by God. How can you choose me? I'm not yet living with my husband. That's an internal struggle we all have when the voice and word of God reaches our ears and penetrates our hearts. If we have never struggled with the word of God, chances are we're not listening carefully. So this new Eve heard the voice of the one who speaks truth. And the one who speaks truth calls her to redeem humanity, not by her life, but by her choice. Be done to me according to your word. As Eve disobeyed because she listened to the father of lies, Mary reversed that first act and she chose to obey the voice of God to bring into the world the one who says, I am the truth. Every other voice may sometimes speak half-truth or blatant lies, but my voice is the voice of truth. I am truth. And so we always need to ask ourselves, do I truly give more time to listen to the voice of truth rather than the voice of lies? What is truth? The more important question is, who is truth? It is none other than Jesus Christ, the one through whom all things came to be and the one through whom all things are recreated going back to its original design, but cannot erase fully because we continue to make choices that listens to the voice of the father of lies, the devil, rather than the father of love, God himself. This Mary, who then says, yes, since she carried Jesus, the word of God, made incarnate through the power of the Spirit, Mary is identified as the new Ark of the Covenant. Remember the old Ark? The old Ark was built by human hands. Mary is the new Ark built by the hands of God. The old Ark carried the word on stone tablets. Mary, the new ark, carries the eternal word, Jesus Christ himself, who will continue to bring the word of his Father to us, his chosen people. And because of Christ's coming, all people are chosen. 
And this ark that was carried into the hill country of Judah, we hear in today's gospel reading, Mary, the new ark, the one who carries the word, the living word, Jesus Christ, she rushes into the hill country. So for people who are aware of the Old Testament, they will see the connection between the old ark of the covenant and the new ark. Again, going back into the hill country. God makes no mistakes. God reveals. But we just have to pay attention. Because the more we do, the more we begin to understand Scripture and what it is that God intends. Fast forward. We hear in today's first reading from the book of Revelation, the vision of a woman reigning in heaven. It can't be Eve. Because of her disobedience, sin and death came into the world. It must be a new woman. Who is this envisioned new woman? Some interpretations could be the church, the bride of Christ. Some, it's our souls because we give ourselves to the Lord. But the most fundamental interpretation is that this woman is a new ark. The woman who chose to listen faithfully to the voice of God when we know honestly we don't do it all the while. The woman who said yes to what God wants when we know we often say no and fall into sin. The woman who was a mother of Jesus Christ who watched her only son die on the cross but was present at his resurrection and saw him ascended into heaven. And anyone who loves one's parents knows very well where your heart lies, where our hearts lie. Wherever mom and dad are, we want to be, even when we leave the home. There is no greater comfort than being in the presence of parents who truly love us. And for those who are parents, you will know there's no greater love than being with the child or children with which you have been blessed. So where Jesus is, his mother is. We hear she stands on the right hand. What does the psalmist say? Sit on my right. Your foes I will put beneath your feet. Foes can be human beings who make themselves enemies. But the most tangible, the most practical enemies we have are sin and death. Jesus died. He literally died. He wasn't asleep. Jesus died and he rose again. Jesus died and rose and ascended to his father. And we hear that he is the first fruits of the resurrection so that those who believe will also follow him. And if Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection, then Mary is a concrete evidence of what will happen to those who believe and who trust God and call upon him. Where the son is, there is a father. There's a spirit, there's a foster father, and there is also his mother. No other human being can ever make that claim. I am the mother of Jesus. Who is Jesus? You are the Christ, the Son of God. We declare Jesus to be equal to the Father and the Holy Spirit, hence the doctrine of the Trinity. So if Jesus is God incarnate, Mary is the mother of God. And when you have a Godhead, there is no separation. There is only unity and harmony and complete love. That's a short explanation from a biblical perspective. We can go into so much more, but we leave that for a classroom. It does bring us to the theological perspective. 
even if we infer all these biblical images onto Mary, how can we say that this really happened? That Mary was assumed bodily and soul into heaven? There are some who question if Mary actually died or if she merely slept dormition and then entered into heaven. If Jesus had to suffer death, then his blessed mother would die. If Jesus had to suffer death, then all of us will die. We're not here forever. But as Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus has the power to raise each of us from the dead. So how does one explain the assumption? First and foremost, those who were closest to that era, that time, that was a popular belief that was circulated. That Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven. Where did that belief come from? Ordinarily, when saints die, their remains are given as relics to be placed in the church, scattered throughout the world. These are placed in the altar or some in other hallowed places. From then till now, there is no church that has a relic of our Blessed Mother. Because the tradition holds that when her so-called grave was dug up, there were no remains. And how does one explain that theologically? Mary was preserved from original sin by the grace and love and mercy of God. She who was preserved from original sin so that she could be the vessel, if she so chooses, to be the mother of Jesus. She who was preserved from original sin, when she died, as she did, then that same grace would preserve her from decay and corruption. This is all due to God's grace. Whenever people struggle with this belief, it is not a struggle about Mary they must question. The real struggle is, do I put limits on the power of my God? Because if God can, and he did, preserve Mary from original sin, then God also has the power to save her and spare her from being corrupted, from ordinary decay, from all that happens to regular people, except for some saints when they die. Theologically, it's all God's work. Those who are weak in faith will struggle with this. Those who have not yet felt the touch and power of God in their lives will struggle with this. It doesn't matter if you come to church or you stay home. It's about that real encounter that one has with one's God, who is our God, and have come to see his power working over and over in our lives. This is a God who restores all of us to new life, but even more importantly, has promised the resurrection, and even more definitively, has assumed Mary by his power, body and soul, into heaven. Which then brings us to the final practical point. What does all this mean? Why do we celebrate these moments, these feasts, these solemnities? And the answer is very simple. What God has done for others, completed, God will do for you. What God has done for others, he will do for you. The practical reason and purpose for these celebrations, these feasts, these solemnities is to remember that the power of God is always with us. 
He calls us all to be his saints, and it's something we struggle with throughout our lives. He calls us all to imitate Mary. When you hear my voice, say yes. Because if you say no, you're imitating Eve's behavior. But because many of us are so weak, we needed God the truth, God the way, God the life to come to save us by his sacrifice so that whenever we honestly own, I'm not saying yes, I'm saying no, we can turn to him and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. The aim of life is to know God, to learn how to please him, to learn how to love him as we learn to love ourselves and each other, which too is also a lifelong journey. But the assumption reminds us that no matter what, as we say in Jamaica, better must come. No matter what we go through, better must come. When the good comes, hold on to it because it will not last for too long. But the same thing is also true when suffering or evil comes. Hold on to God because it will not last forever. The more we trust God, the more we will see his power in our lives. The more we will thank him for those who have gone before us, who have set the stage and example, Mary and all the saints. Not by their merits, but because they learned how to listen to God. How to yield to the power of the Spirit. And how to say yes. Yes, Lord. Be done to me according to your word. May that too be our prayer. Yes, Lord. I hear you speaking. Yes, Lord, you know how weak I am. Yes, Lord, I have many questions. Yes, Lord, I fail and fall, but Lord, by your grace, you pick me up. So help me, Lord, as I say yes. May it be done to me according to your word. To him, beloved, be glory and praise forever and ever.